got another uh, interesting uh, developer session here. We've got the uh, TY Smelter um, future, uh, and we're also going to have the Arua representatives, Jackie Kane and Amy Kayo, joining Chris, Nicole, and Darren. Kiora Conicole Toko Ingoa no Brisbane. I'm Nicole and I'm the Closure Readiness General Manager for Rio Tinto. I've been working with the team at TY over the past few years on our closure readiness plans and making sure we have the plans in place should we proceed with closure. But more importantly, what we've been also working on is our partnership with Naitahu, specifically Awarua Runaka, and also the remediation work at the smelter. And that's what we're really proud to be here today to talk to you about. Okay, so what we'll be covering today is the partnership with Notahu, and Jackie will be presenting that for us. We'll also be talking about the progressive remediation project we have underway at ENSYS, and Darren and Amy will cover those topics. And of course, Chris will talk to what you all want to hear about is ongoing operations at ENSYS. So I'll hand straight over to Jackie. Atamari Kaito, Tine to Mahino Nuike, a Kaito, Kia, Hui Hui, my nae, Roto, it co papa, Tineira, no Awarua Ho, a Tipuaki Ho, a Ronga Tamaru, or Motopohe, Rawako, Hananoi, called Jackie Kane, Takuikua, a Mahiana Ho, a Ronga Teruna, Ngaitahu. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jackie. I'm at group head at the, uh, the office of Te Runa Ngongaitahu in Ototahi, but here uh, today with my awarua portai on and as a member of the TY advisory group. Now is it this clicker? So um, after some extensive and sometimes fraught negotiations, um, we signed an MOU in October 2002, and this is an MOU between the Runaka of Marahuku, Te Runango Ngaitahu, together with NZS and Rio Tinto. And what this MOU is looking at is uh, restoring the whenua at the TY Peninsula, and also working together on the future of the TY aluminium smelter beyond December 2024. And I want to acknowledge uh, the many people in this room who participated in those negotiations, and in particular the Upoko of Awarua Ta Tipani for your wise counsel through those discussions. So this MIU seeks to capture a partnership that will ensure the strong voice of Mirahuku Runaka um, regarding the remediation and the future of the smelter. But I think it's also fair to say that NZS, for its part, acknowledges um, that with engagement with mana whenua, um, it's invaluable to have that voice uh, as they continue to progressively remediate the site. So all parties have agreed to work together on plans to remove waste, conduct environmental monitoring, and remediate the TY site, which is a key priority for all of us in this community. Awarua is leading the partnership on behalf of Mirahuku Runaka um, and is actively engaging with NZS and all parties around remediation, cultural considerations and future intentions. And I think it's fair to say that this is a partnership that has um, been a bit of a journey. Um, there has been a lot of learning along the way. It's been difficult at times because we've got quite different styles of operating, but I think that we're, we're getting to a really good place. Um, I also want to note the comments that we've been hearing over the last couple of days, um, including from the Minister, about the need for a decision by Rio Tinto about the future of the smelter. I think Mirahuku, um, Papatipu Runaka and Ngaitahu acknowledge that we all want this certainty, but this is a complicated negotiation involving more than one party. Uh, and we would ask that, um, you know, for all those parties involved in the negotiation, um, this is a significant e um, economic decision, but we ask that you keep the community interests in mind in that. Yes. 
So an advisory group has been established to progress the work under this MOU, with three representatives each from Te Runako Awarua and from uh, Rio Tinto. So this advisory group has met monthly since signing the MOU, and as I said, we're, we're quite proud of the way that this, this journey is progressing. In December last year, we agreed that uh, there's some key values or principles that, is gui that are guiding our mahi. So we support the ongoing operation of the smelter is a key one. And our remediation and waste philosophy is to reduce, reuse and recycle with a shared goal to protect our tūroa, mahinga kai practices and principles and the whānau undertaking them at or near the Awarua Tiwai Peninsula in the coastal environment. So we'll continue to work on, um, we'll also continue to work on the identification and protection plan on Wahitapu, Wahitaonga and other sites of significance. So the TY Advisory Group has also established a remediation advisory working group, or fondly known as the ROG, um, with technical expertise to work together on restoring the Whenua TY Peninsula. So the ROG includes four representatives from Awarua, Runaku and Ngaitahu, and four representatives from NZAS who meet and work together to progress this important mahi. Uh, we'll have Amy and Darren speak to their work very shortly. And in April, we announced the Mirahuku Runaka and Rio Tinto NZAS Community Development Fund. So this fund acknowledges Mirahuku Runaka's mana whenua and supports investment in a sustainable and f positive future for mana whenua and the wider community. Through the fund, $2 million is available uh, through to the end of next year, and uh, Rio Tinto has uh, indicated that they will and extend the fund um, beyond 2024 should a long-term future for the smelter be secured. So this fund will support projects around four focus areas, around enhancing diversity, equity, inclusion and health and wellbeing outcomes across the community, intergenerational culture, heritage, conservation and environmental outcomes, unlocking human potential and community resilience through education, science and innovation and workforce development, and contributing to the region's economic development and climate transition by supporting businesses to expand and new industries to emerge. So applications for the first round of funding are currently open and we've already received a number, which is great. Um, and these will close on the 12th of June. So there's still time to get in an application and you'll find all the information um, about the fund and the application forms on the NZS website. So kia ora, thanks for listening this morning and I'll now hand over to our board members. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora tātou, ko Darren, tō, tō ku ingoa, uh, e mahi ana ahau ki te wai. Uh, Morena tātou, uh, ko Amy Kyle tō ku ingoa, he uri tēnei nō Ngaitahu Te Arua uh, me ngā pohi hoki nō Awarua ahau. Uh, o te rā tēnā koutou katoa. Um, so, yes, Darren and I are part of ROG. Um, feels like it needs a fist pump, ROG. <laughs> Um, and what our group are tasked with um, is phase one of um, the progressive remediation. Um, so we'll go into that um, into some more detail shortly. Um, our role as Ngaitahu on Rorg is to ensure that there is a social and cultural lens applied to all environmental remediation of TY Point with current and future generations in mind. Um, and we're extremely fortunate that across the ROG group, we're a multidisciplinary team, um, so we have environmental, stormwater and mahinga kai experts at the table, as well as uh, strategic and engagement focused members. Um, and to date, from our end, I think all of us, it's been a really productive and positive process, um, and we've been really encouraged by um, NZASs, NZASs, um, openness and willingness to learn um, and to um, work through this co-design process with us. So over to you, Darren. Um, in this no stranger to environmental monitoring. We've had a thorough environmental monitoring program ever since the smelter was put there. 
that program has uh, typically been in excess of what's required for consents, and it has evolved over time as uh, society's developed as well. Um, since 2020, we've really undertaken a very uh, detailed uh, set of studies around the, the peninsula and the site, um, and that, that's led on. Um, with the formation of the ROG, our monitoring program will continue to evolve. The iwi influence provo promotes a more holistic view uh, that combines our analytical and cultural elements uh, to the benefit of all. It's been a really healthy change. Ends of staff, we've got 800 uh, very passionate Southlanders work down at TY. Um, we take our kaitiakitanga responsibilities very seriously, um, but the nature of our business means that we're predominantly employing engineers and scientists and technical people that love data and analytics. So broadening the view with bringing in that strong cultural lens has been a really positive change. Um, having worked with the, the ROG for a few months now, the aspirations of iwi that they're bringing, I would say, reflects the aspirations of Kiwis generally. There's no conflict there. The, the photos that you see on this slide um, are from our DSI. They show exceedances against the industrial standards on the left, recreational standard on the right uh, for exceedances in soil and sediments. Um, the main contaminants that are present on site are fluoride and aluminium. Uh, in soil, most of that contamination sits in about the top 200 millimetres. The soil contamination impacts groundwater and contaminant concentrations tend to decrease as we get closer to the coast. We understand that the main pathway to the CMA is via the three drains that you can see all the yellow dots there. And um, we've started to work to address the environmental issues while the site is still operating. And this is a really key focus of the ROG. I'll hand back to Amy. Um, so ROG have agreed to um, the scope of work for phase one, which includes, oh, I've got the wrong slide, so I'll just jump to this one, um, which includes um, uh, these things on screen. So the scope of work um, for the first phase includes the co-design and working together to define the standards and criteria for progressive remediation. Um, and following that is working together to develop the remediation plans. Um, so together we've developed a strategic framework to guide our co-design process. And this incorporates the cultural and social lens I touched on earlier. So the strategic outcomes that we are striving for are to ensure we have safe and abundant mahinga kai in Tiwai Peninsula in the receiving environment that is accessible to whānau. Um, we're also striving for a thriving ecosystem on Tiwai Peninsula in the receiving environment. Uh, also the protection of wahi tapu, wahi tauka in the cultural landscape. And for whānau katoa, for everyone, um, ensuring that we're able to safely undertake activities on Tiwai Peninsula uh, and the receiving environment. So underpinning our full program of work and the co-design process are the guiding principles of whanaungatanga, um, ensuring that we respect each other and we maintain and foster relationships. Uh, manakitanga, we pay respect to each other, we just work well to e uh, with each other, um, in accordance with tikanga, um, tohinga tanga, we'll, we will ensure that we have expertise to guide us along the way. Uh, Kaitiaki tanga, Darren mentioned earlier, you know, we all act as guardians for that whole area. Um, and rangatira tanga, ensuring that the rights, interests, and aspirations of Awarua Runanga are upheld. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a learning journey, we're, we're on this journey together. Um, and the first part of, um, sorry, I've got different slides. Different order. Okay. Um, so, biota sampling. So an important part of um, co-designing the standards and criteria 
is understanding all parts of the environment. So all Southlanders will agree that ensuring the health of our coastal environment is important. So this enables us to have access and have the ability to harvest kai that is safe for us to eat. Um, so part of the rural strategy is ensuring that we're able to continue mahinga kai practice. Um, and a key indicator of coastal health for us, and should be for all of us, is uh, that is of coastal health is via biota sampling. So as you'll see on screen, um, a significant amount of biota sampling has been conducted. Um, samples were collected for gastropods, mussels, power, falc, kina, cockles, puppies, bluff oysters and snails. Um, and yeah, positive preliminary results. So this indicates that based on the chemical composition of the biota, these organisms are suitable for human consumption, which is great. Uh, and the first test for the strategic uh, framework that I've just talked about to be applied is going to be on the landfill. I think I've clicked too much now. And back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, the landfill has obviously been an area of public concern. Um, the landfill does mark uh, as our most exciting progressive remediation opportunity though. Um, it's a very significant part of our closure provision. It's remote from the site and closing it, remediating it and doing that well um, has no bearing on the operations. So it's a really fantastic opportunity for us to, to cut our teeth and show our commitment. Um, the landfill on site has operated continuously from the construction of the site until the start of May last year where we voluntarily closed the gates and uh, would not accept any more product into the landfill. The landfill does remain operational though because we are in the process of removing materials and there's also maintenance activities to be done up there. For that reason we need to continue to have a consent, our existing consent expires at the end of this year and so we've elected to take on a strategy of applying for two consents. The first consent is a short term five year consent with appropriate controls that allows the time for the co-design process to work to ensure that we ultimately end up with the very best possible outcome uh, for that part of the whenua and uh, for all stakeholders involved. The guidance that we've had from the advisory group has been that um, they're concerned about getting the right outcome, not the quickest outcome. So we'll take our time, it is complex and we'll work through it. To support the um, the consent, there's been an awful lot of environmental work done up there. We've taken, done ecological, climate change, environmental and different types of impact studies on the landfill. The studies confirm that we've got good records about what's been deposited and where the boundaries of the waste are. We know that 90% of the uh, water flow under the landfill moves towards Favo Strait and not Arua Bay, which provides a nice dynamic area. Um, most locations have a decreasing contaminant concentrations. Um, the natural groundwater chemistry actually acts to reduce contaminant concentrations prior to them getting to the CMA. About 70% of the landfill site is vegetated and may hold tonga uh, flora and fauna species. So it's a very uh, significant part. We've looked at coastal erosion and we do have time to do this work. We do not believe that there's any risk to the landfill for the next 100 years. So that provides time to do the work really well. Um, the other really significant chunk of our closure provision is around dealing with our, our byproducts. Uh, when we make aluminium and reduction cells, at the end of that cell's life, we have to rebuild it. The lining comes out, it's known as SCL. We have quite a bit of that around the plant. We have been exporting that material continuously uh, for at least the last 12 years. Uh, where we've been dealing with the amount that we generate. We're really looking to amp that up. We do have contracts in place for up to 30,000 tonnes. That's about six times what we would normally export. Uh, we have one basal permit in place and we're working hard on securing the second to really enact that. We're not putting all of our eggs in that basket though. We're also conducting a study into the feasibility of building a plant on site that removes the hazardous components. And um, you know, to that end, we've recently gone into the pad twice 
which has been sealed since 1992 to take samples and characterise that material. Dross residues, um, aluminium in molten form loves to react with air. Uh, when it does, it creates an oxide layer that we skim off our furnaces and crucibles. Our dross processes take off the free aluminium, return that to us. The residue is then exported for recycling in other industries. Uvea, um, we re we've repatriated about 25,000 tonnes of Uvea from the community. The last of that was brought back to site in November uh, 2022. Our export program with that is going very, very well. We, this month we've passed the halfway point in terms of exports, and by the end of the year we expect to be better than two-thirds of the way through that product. So that's, uh, that's going really well. We do also have dross residues in our landfill, and we're starting the work now to reclaim that and process it. So with that, I'll hand over. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Uh, kia ora, kia ora tato, namihi kia koutou, ko waho, ko Chris Blinkine, toko ingoa, no Manawatu, aho, uh, nori rā, kia ora tato katoa. Um, for those I haven't met, I'm Chris Blinkine. That's how you have a crack at that last name for those wanting to have a go. Um, uh, I'm the chief executive down at TY, uh, so lovely to, to see you all. Um, I, I, as the team have mentioned, I thought I'd update you on a couple of the key topics as we have going forward. Um, what I did want to do to start with, though, is just to highlight, I started in this gig uh, back in January last year. Um, why is probably another question, uh, but, but I started in January and I, I made the decision very clearly when I started that, that each and every time I was given the opportunity to engage publicly on TY, uh, like this, that I'd always start on remediation. Because as far as I was concerned, and still am concerned, that is an anchor that Midihuku deserves to be proud of, New Zealand needs to be proud of, of the site and the fenner at TY Point. And, and there's been at times where that has not been the case. And rather than shy away from that, we need to front up to that and say we are doing the work that's required to get on top of it. And so I just want to sort of highlight, and in particular, actually, I want to thank in this forum, um, as, as Jackie mentioned, um, to sit here today with you know, our partners, Naitahu, to talk about our remediation program is a really proud moment for me. Um, to see how far that we've come, and we've still got a lot of mahi to do. We, we're still a long way from where we want to be, but we're going in the right direction. And I do specifically want to kind of thank you know, Amy and, and Jackie, um, Terry, I'm not sure if Gail's in the room, but Gail, um, Mike Stevens, who usually hangs around the corner there reading his book or something, um, Ta, ta um, I've dug myself a hole because now I won't remember all the rest of the people. Um, but Barry, there's a lot of people involved in this, and, and I just want to genuinely and sincerely thank you for as you say, sort of having lengthy discussions over a period of time, but, but I'm, I'm so really proud of where we've got to. And Tata Bene, thank you for your guidance, as Jackie pointed, and, and, and push us in the right direction. It is genuinely uh, appreciated. Um, when we signed the MOU, it was in September. It wasn't quite 2002, it was 22, but that's all right. Um, I'm happy if it was 2002. Um, the, uh, when we signed it last year, uh, I was walking around site a couple of days later, and... Um, and one of the team members came up to me and he said, Chris, why did we sign this thing? Like, what, what's, what's the value in it for us? I, I don't really understand that. Um, and I started talking to him about, you know, the Te Māori world view and sort of intergenerational views. And then I just stopped and I, and I said, you know, the easiest way that I could describe the value in this partnership, if we had the relationship and the partnership with Naitahu that we're building today, if we had that 10 years ago, Every fibre in my being believes we would be in a different place than we are now. That's a genuine statement, and <laughs> I won't repeat what he said. I will repeat what he said. Um, oh, good shit. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good thing. I'm happy with that then, Chris. And I said, well, thank you for your approval. That's very good. Um, but but I, I think that's just the simplest way. And for those businesses, and we've talked about the Māori economy, and we've talked about kind of working with mana whenua, for me, we are a walking case study of when you might stub your toe on things, when you get it right, it can be very, very powerful. And I'm adamant that the relationship that we've got going forward, I can't change where we've been in the past, uh, but I'm adamant that I'll play a, at least a small role on what we're doing going forward. So uh, again, thank you to, to Naitahu for that. Um, so I will cover a, a couple of topics. I, I fear I might tread on some trodden earth here uh, on some key topics that it's already been spoken about, but I'll, I'll do my best to either um, be marginally over time or at least not massively over time. Um, 
I just want to start with carbon and, and the story. We've talked a lot about decarbonisation here, which is a worthy topic. Um, and, and it breaks my heart a little bit that, you know, through some, some corporate behaviour or whatever it is, that the, the story of carbon and TY does get lost or at least not as clearly understood as I think it deserves to be. Um, what I've got up there on the slide, ho hopefully, uh, it, it's a graph that shows every known aluminium smelter on the planet and it's got the carbon emissions per tonne of aluminium that's produced. And you can see where TY sits in that scale. So when we say that we're low carbon, we're not just marginally better, we're damn near the best on the planet. Um, and for clarity, so the emissions profile of TY, we are around two tonnes of carbon for every one tonne of aluminium that we produce. The global average is 12 or 13 tonnes of carbon per tonne of aluminium. I'm, for the sake of going over time, I'm just going to, we are two tonnes of carbon per one tonne, average is 12 to 13 tonnes. It is very safe to say that in the event of a TY closure, and I'm hopeful that's a long way into the future, but in the event of a closure, global emissions goes up significantly. That is something that I'm really proud of, and it's something that I think New Zealand should be damn proud of, that we are making quite literally some of the lowest carbon aluminium on the planet right here in Mitihuku. Um, I do just want to go to another slide related to that, because um, a lot of people talk to me about, well, yeah, you got access to the renewable energy, so isn't that sort of a free kick? And, and you're absolutely right. To get to the first edge of that curve, you saw that big sort of downward slope, you've got to be on renewables to have your ticket to the game. Um, what I've put up on the slide here, our emissions profile is the little green line there. Back in the early 90s, we were about four tonnes of carbon per tonne of aluminium. And so then a whole bunch of work went on, and there's a bunch of people involved in this in the room, one of which is our Deputy Mayor, uh, who was involved in putting projects together to significantly decrease our emissions out at TY. And you'll see there that in the mid-90s, we reduced by over six to 700,000 tonnes of carbon per annum. And uh, there's a gentleman, uh, I think his name was David, from uh, Carbon Economics that talked about yesterday, and I completely agree. We should be celebrating every single decarbonisation project that's going on. I anybody that does work to reduce the number of CO2 particles that goes into the atmosphere and gets rid of, I think currently we're about 420 particles per million in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere, any project that stops that should be celebrated, not just the ones that started from, say, 2018 onwards. And that is something that we should be really proud of. We have a really strong carbon story around the world and we have a damn good carbon story here in Aotearoa. Um, I, I put it relative to iron and steel making. Now, I want to be crystal clear. That is not to say that the recently announced New Zealand Steel Project is something that should not be celebrated. It should be. It falls into that place of reducing the emissions into the atmosphere. And full disclosure, I used to work at New Zealand Steel and I was part of that project, so I think it is really good. Um, but I, I would highlight, where we're talking about that being our biggest decarbonisation project that this country's been on, maybe that's the case, but it's only marginally better to what we did in the 90s. So I think that's something that we should be celebrating, and if I'm brutally honest, it's something that we should be saving and not be talking about closing it. And if I'm brutally honest, we should be talking about replicating this anywhere that we can around the planet. So I'll move on to, um, to the future side now. Um, and look, I know, I know that you want me to, to stand up here and give you certainty, and there's not a lot that I'm going to be able to tell you uh, that, that might answer the questions you might have. What I'd say, and, and Jackie articulated it as she does so well, um, these are very complex and ongoing discussions. Um, we started those discussions in about August last year and uh, the reason for that is because I was very clear we needed to demonstrate to Mirihiku and to Aotearoa that the remediation program was an anchor and it's something that we will do, irrespective of whether we smelt aluminium beyond the end of 2024 or not. Once we started talking to the generators, uh, and I just want to be clear, we are talking to multiple generators. So in the past, it's been sort of a discussion directly with Meridian, and, but the EA and people have been very clear, they want us to run a market process. So what that means is we are talking to a number of generators, and the easiest metaphor I can explain, it's like trying to buy your house from someone, from five different people that own your house, and those five different people aren't allowed to talk to each other. So it is a very complex discussion that we're doing, but we are working tirelessly on doing that. And as Jackie also pointed out, I would just take this opportunity to highlight, it's not just us that I would argue we need to keep moving things along. I can't negotiate with myself in the mirror, although I do that sometimes to practice. Um, 
it, it does take our counterparties to want us to be here and to work constructively as we all need to do. And I respect the, the point. Um, and I would highlight the ambiguity of not knowing our future. Yes, it impacts the community. Yes, it impacts the energy sector. It impacts national discussions. But I'm going to be a little bit selfish. The reason that we need to get the ambiguity out of the way is for the thousand odd folks that go behind that gate every single day and smelt aluminium. The ambiguity for them hurts them more than anybody else and it breaks my heart to have to go and I talk to them every single day and it's incredibly tough. So we need to I keep them front of mind as we go through these discussions. Um, I, I, what I can, I just want to highlight a couple of key areas that we're, we're having a different kind of discussion this time around. So I can't give specifics on sort of where we're at and those sorts of things, although Terry's probably going to ask me that in his question time. Um, I've got a question. Oh, sure. Um, ten. Um, the, um, the, 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 get on in front of that. Um, uh, a few key things that we are doing differently. First of all, term. We've been very clear. We want to be here. There is no ambiguity in that. We, Rio Tinto, our JV partners, we want to be here and we want to be here for the long term. We are talking of contracts in excess of 15 years. That's what we're aiming for, that's what we're talking about. I want to be very clear and transparent that that's what we're aiming for. Number two is around demand response. It's been touched on a lot here uh, in the crowd. I just want to highlight, three or four weeks ago, there was an announcement that we've reached an agreement with Meridian for a 50 megawatt demand response deal, which I think should be celebrated. It's the first time in this country that we have put a contract together. Um, it's subject to the EA approval. Sorry for all the lawyers in the room. Sorry, I just got that cleared up. Um, Jason Morley at Meridian will be very upset if I didn't mention that. Um, but that 50 megawatt demand response is the first time that we've had that product available to the generators well before any hydrology issues. So in the past, we would get close to a hydrology issue, would have a conversation between us, and then we would make appropriate decisions. And we have dialed back energy eight out of the last 10 years. But this is something that, you know, give, if EA approve it, it sits with Meridian, and it's the ability to manage those hydrology issues for the duration of the rest of our contract. And 50 megawatts is certainly not to be sneezed at. It's a significant contract that allows some of the certainty to come into the grid. Um, what I've put up here, I'm getting to the slide, um, is what we are talking about actively with our partners. And so there's two types of demand response that we're talking about. One is around peaking, which is early mornings, late nights for a couple of hours demand shift. Right now, TUI can take demand off within a matter of minutes to 30, 50 megawatts at a time and do that in the mornings and in the evenings. We're actively talking to people about that. And I know that there's technology that will be spoken about that we are actively thinking about and working with our partners on how we can go deeper for longer. Um, the other element is, is dry year response. So that is literally taking out our production for days, weeks, months at a time. Largely that's when there's a dry year issue occurring and freeing that power back up into the grid. Any new arrangement that we get together would have this built into it as we go forward. And I've just put some scenarios up there on what we're talking about. These sorts of things in the past we would probably keep out. I'm saying let's just put it out there and be very open about what we're talking about. The third thing um, that I do want to highlight, and Minister Woods touched on it yesterday, um, is the build out of new renewables. Any new contract that we would be able to sign, uh, we know will incentivize new renewables coming on stream. What's become very clear is that if we do that in a partnered way, a balance sheet like Rio Tinto's, which is AAA rated, will bring the cost of capital down on those projects considerably. So what that ultimately means is that the LTOE, the, the, the cost of energy on those projects, materially comes down and enables us to work in a partnered way to try and find a globally competitive power price. Because I mean, we can't shy away from that. That's what we need to, to enable an operation. I can't speak on behalf of anybody else, but anybody who's accessing the global markets, I'm sure, will say we need a globally competitive power price to be able to sell and transact our products to the world. But by doing it in a partnered way, by putting a balance sheet to work, that's a way that we can partner up, provide lower cost energy, not just for us, but potentially free that up into the market as well. So I'm just trying to give you some insight on sort of the layers of complexity that we're dealing with. It's not just a, we're the biggest player, give us the best price or we're out of here. That is not the way to create a partnership and we need to do it differently and we are doing it differently, but it does take time. But I want to be upfront that that's what we're talking about. I'm getting to the end, don't worry. It's, uh, the, um, the last part that I wanted to sort of highlight on, on the slides here, um, aluminium smelters, and it was mentioned yesterday, have, have always been built to sort of valorise energy, to, to basically take electricity, turn it into jobs, turn it into GDP, turn it into sort of profitability for the country. Um, 
they still do that. That's, that's kind of their job. They have to do more. They have to participate in the energy sector, which is exactly what we're doing. Um, what I've put up here, and I want to be really clear about this because it can be misconstrued and you'll throw tomatoes at me. I, this is about demonstrating that when you look at it in the lens of what's available to Mirihiku, there's lots of great options that are available to us. And we need to move the conversation away from an or discussion because then you have to start making some of these trade-offs. And that's not the right discussion. The discussion should be, how do we have the and discussion? And Rod was right. How do we get low-cost green electrons to make us more and more available to us to allow us to add these scenarios and portfolios together? Because I'll just point to the bottom one there, domestic fossil fuel abatement. So taking a coal-fired boiler and electrifying it. No one in this room is going to argue that that's a bad thing to do. That's a fantastic thing to do and we need to do more of it. So I'm not saying any of these are bad in any way. What I'm saying is when you put it together, this is what the growth is available to us. And yes, I argue the smelter does provide that bedrock for the community in terms of jobs and GDP, which is why we're fighting so hard to keep it here. The carbon story is why we're fighting so hard to keep it here. But it needs to be an and. We can be a, a, an off-taker of a hydrogen plant we use LNG in our cast house, we use different uh, materials that we can convert, we're commercially viable, to look at these sorts of opportunities. So I want to be open about that. We want to talk about those sorts of things when they're viable and commercial, and, and the government's announcement might assist that. But this is why I think it's so important for us to move forward into a growth discussion as opposed to anything else. So I'll, I'll, I think there's a summary slide. I can't read all of that stuff, but um, I'm probably better at today, or I butcher the English side. Um, the, um, what I do want to be clear on is we often get canvassed with this ambiguity tag. So I want to be very explicit. There is no ambiguity. We want to be here and we want to be here for the long term. That's not just our decision though. We need to be working with our partners and they need to want that too. The second part, we will remediate the site. We are remediating the site irrespective of 2024 or not. That work will continue. And the third part I just want to highlight is that carbon story. It breaks my heart that we're all not proud and loud about that story because it's something I'm really proud to be part of and it's pretty much the reason why I jumped on board and I'm fighting to save this place. But with that, you can ask your tough questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris. Um, look, we just got a bit of a sermon about you don't have to uh, be able to sell a car to go to post Toastmasters. Um, but look, Chris is right. Uh, Ivan Valor actually uh, guaranteed to uh, Tatipani and uh, a lot of the other Miraku runanga down at Ararua that he was committed to remediate. And um, that's what he said. And uh, Chris has just actually um, referred to that. Um, Selfin's got to have a bit of hope when uh, Chris has just said that they are actually negotiating a 15-year power price agreement, which is, um, you know, it gives the uh, community and gives the province some um, some more hope that uh, if they can actually negotiate that power price agreement, that would um, that would be great. Chris, I have got one question for you, and it's it's not a zero to ten. I'm hoping it's a ten. If you stay, will you convert to green? industry into a green process? We're the cleanest. Is that right? We're the cleanest on the planet. So we are. We are right now, and that, that's, that's one of the key points here. There is no smelter operating around the world. Marge, we, those ones that push towards that top end, that's where you get a bit of scale, and so you're able to sort of push that, that carbon intensity a bit further. But we should recognise right now, we are the cleanest on the planet. I, I think what you might be referring to is, so Rio is also working on a technology called Alysis. Yep. It's zero smelting technology up in Canada. It's not commercial yet, but we are further advanced than any other company in the world on zero carbon aluminium. That, that looks like it's about two years away from commercialisation, um, and then you have to effectively build back the supply chain. So once you commercialise it, you've got to make it sort of available to install. Um, Rio Tinto has made a global commitment to be zero carbon by 2050. So you start putting those two things together. If TY is operating at the back end of that cycle, inevitably you're, you have to make a decision as related to that. Um, and, and Rio would say one of the, the most difficult thing to find when you're talking about building aluminium smelting or operations like this is you need green energy, 
you need a deep water port, and I, I mean Woodside would probably reference this, you, you need a workforce that are passionate and know what they're doing. Those are the hard things to find. And that's right. what we've got here in Mirihiki. Right, I'm starting to believe this guy. I'll leave, uh, one more question. <laughs> One more question. It's taken a year and a half. Year and a, it's, it's taken a year and a half, you know. One more question. Come on, give me a, give me a question. I'm starting to believe this guy. Everybody's believing you, Chris. I don't believe it. <laughs> you better get off here while the going's good. Oh, you want one, uh, Dave? Uh, I, I think um, I think Dave, the, there's been a lot of history that's gone on the bridge, and I think sometimes when we're talking about TY, there's passion involved on, on, on either way. You heard a bit of passion from me. If you look at this dispassionately, and you sit back with the community good, it might have been Jackie. If you look at it, the community good, and and, and the big picture, and Mike Fuge, oh, I'm sorry, Mike Fuge referenced this on the New Zealand Steel deal. When you look at it in that lens, then there's a future here. And if everyone can look at it through that lens, then the right outcome gets made. But, but we have to put our hands up that part of that passion has come from our behaviour in the past and we've got to front up to that. So, but if I, if I had a wish, that, that would be what it would be. Or, or a really cheap price. No more questions, he's convincing us. Okay, put a big hand to the uh, big clap for the panel.